Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper, beginning with an article from the front page of the Delhi edition. The annual state of education report has been published for 2020. This is a popular survey that is published in the field of education and it is a nationwide survey that primarily focuses on gauging the state of education in the rural areas of the country with the objective of measuring learning outcomes and access to education. This popular education survey is carried out by a NGO known as Pratham and it has been published for the last 15 years and it has become a very important tool for policy makers. This article carries some of the important findings of the ASER report and it helps us understand the state of rural education in the country and as well as the impact of the pandemic on rural education. See, this topic is particularly important for your mains examination and hence you need not remember the facts and the statistics that has been brought out by the report. The focus of our discussion should be on the broad trends and patterns found in rural education which could be very helpful while writing mains answers and even a related essay topic. One of the most alarming findings of the report is with regard to access to textbooks and learning material. Shockingly, the report shows that nearly 20% of rural children do not have access to any kind of textbooks. These children particularly do not have textbooks at their home and this lack of access to learning material, especially at a time when schools are closed as a result of the pandemic, is bound to affect learning activity. So as a result, the survey has found out that learning activity has gone down in the rural areas and one of the primary reasons is the lack of access to textbooks and learning material at homes. Next, the survey clearly establishes that the pandemic is perpetuating a learning divide because of the prevalent digital divide in the country. Since schools and colleges have closed around the country because of the pandemic, learning has largely shifted to online platforms and access to such online learning is directly dependent on one's ability to possess a smartphone or a laptop. But the survey shows that only 62% of India's rural households possess a smartphone as of 2020. And hence, children from the rest of the rural families do not have access to these digital devices, thereby depriving them access to online learning platforms and learning material. Over the last two years, the adoption of smartphones in rural areas has gone up significantly. But despite this, there exists a wide gap which is perpetuating a learning divide in the country. See, this digital divide persists in the urban areas as well to a certain extent. But however, a majority of the children in urban areas and those belonging to well-off families, they have a higher access to these digital devices and high-speed internet. But the digital divide is very profound and aggravated in the rural areas and a number of rural households are not able to access these devices. So this directly deprives children from these rural families from gaining access to online learning platforms and learning materials. The survey has also shown that WhatsApp has become the most preferred learning platform in the rural areas primarily because it is a free application as compared to high-end applications such as Zoom, Webex of Cisco, Microsoft Teams, etc. which are more prevalent in the urban areas. Then the survey also shows that new enrollment in schools has gone down because of the pandemic. Back in 2018, the percentage of children in the age group of 6 to 10 years who were not enrolled in school was just at 1.8% and in 2020, this has increased to 5.3%. So clearly, the closure of schools as a result of the pandemic has affected new enrollments and this is bound to have a long-term impact on rural education. Now let's take up an editorial from page number 6 that evaluates the state of India-US relations following the 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue. See, over the last few days, we have elaborately covered the 2 plus 2 dialogue, but what it clearly establishes is that the India-US relationship is on a firm footing because the visit of the US Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense to India comes at a time when the United States is headed towards elections in a few days. Now, this is very significant in the world of diplomacy and international relations because generally, when a country is headed towards elections, no major foreign policy commitment is made either by that country or by its partners. In the run-up to an election, 
both the sides would be holding back because any change in government could possibly result in a reversal of the policy decisions that have been made by the earlier government. But the fact that India and US chose to go ahead with the 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue with just a few days left for the US presidential elections and the fact that they signed a foundational agreement such as BECA clearly shows that the India-US relationship is election proof. Meaning a change of government in either of the countries is unlikely to affect the nature of the bilateral relationship and the commitments made by both the sides. The relationship has reached a certain level of maturity wherein it doesn't really matter which party is in power in either of the countries and irrespective of the party in power, both the countries are likely to stick on to their commitments considering the strategic significance that this relationship has acquired. And it was not just the BECA that was signed during the 2 plus 2 dialogue but several other key agreements were also signed between the two countries. Yesterday, we did speak about a few of those agreements but apart from that, several other agreements were also signed including the issuance of joint statements on several issues that signals a common approach of India and US when it comes to these areas of strategic importance. Agreements have been signed to promote cooperation between India and US in jointly fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. An agreement has been signed for joint cooperation in the building of strategic petroleum reserves. Joint cooperation agreements have been signed in the field of renewable energy, space, cyber security, counter-terrorism and as well as with regard to counter-narcotics. Then one of the biggest takeaways for India was that a joint statement was issued that calls upon Pakistan to take immediate, sustained and irreversible action against cross-border terrorism that emanates from its soil. And both the countries have called upon Pakistan to bring to justice the perpetrators of major terror attacks such as the 2611, the Uri attacks, the Patan Court attacks, etc. But apart from all these issues that were addressed during the 2 plus 2 dialogue, the biggest focus was on China. During the entire summit, the US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in particular made repeated statements against China and he even labelled the Chinese Communist Party as a threat to international law and a rules-based world order. He repeatedly called upon India to build a counter-coalition against China's aggressiveness and he stated that such an Indo-Pacific alliance of like-minded countries was needed in order to provide an alternative to China's hegemony in the Indo-Pacific region. This aggressive stand against China taken by the US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo at the 2 plus 2 dialogue is in line with the aggressive strategy of the Trump administration that is looking to scale up tensions with China in the run-up to US presidential elections. So it is no wonder that the US Secretary of State would be travelling to other important countries in the Indian Ocean region such as Sri Lanka, Maldives and Indonesia after winding up the 2 plus 2 dialogue in India. Reportedly, the US has even made an attempt to bring Sri Lanka, Indonesia and a few other countries in the Indo-Pacific region under the informal quadrilateral grouping and reportedly, the US is pursuing the establishment of such a quad plus in order to build it as a counter coalition against China. It is with this objective in mind that the United States is looking to scale up its diplomatic and military presence in the Indian Ocean region and this explains the decision of the US to establish an embassy in Maldives. So essentially, the United States has used the 2 plus 2 dialogue platform with India to send out a strong message to China and naturally, it has invoked an angry response from China. But an interesting observation is that India has carefully evaded getting caught in this tussle between the two superpowers. Because India has repeatedly stated over the last couple of years that it doesn't believe in any alliance formation targeted against a particular country due to its firm belief in the principle of strategic autonomy which forms the foundational principle of India's foreign policy. See, the principle of strategic autonomy refers to independent foreign policy decision making that serves India's national interests and this has been the foundational principle that Indian diplomacy has followed since the times of Prime Minister Nehru. Yes, India does appreciate its strategic relationship with the United States and it does seek out closer defence relations with the US primarily to promote joint cooperation, joint training, joint military exercises, intelligence sharing and to enhance interoperability between the armed forces of the two nations. But however, it doesn't mean that India is seeking to form an alliance against a particular country 
and this has been repeatedly highlighted by the prime minister by india's foreign minister and as well as by the top leadership of the indian government the prime minister when he addressed the shangri la dialogue a couple of years ago he made it clear that india's indo pacific strategy doesn't entail the formation of any alliance then recently india's foreign minister dr s jay shankar stated that india does not see itself as an ally of any country and it doesn't wish to form any clubs targeted against a particular country this policy of india is in line with its stated approach of dealing with any dispute as a bilateral matter between india and the other country for example be it the kashmir dispute with pakistan or the aksai chin lac dispute with china india treats both of them as a bilateral matter between india pakistan and india china respectively and as a matter of policy it has not encouraged any third party involvement in these disputes and it doesn't encourage the formation of any alliances or clubs honestly it is very tempting for india to enter into such alliances with us japan australia and other like minded countries with the objective of targeting china especially at a time when china has been so aggressive against india with regard to the lac dispute but however if india accepts third party assistance in this matter and if it seeks to form an alliance against china then it would contradict its stand on the kashmir dispute because since many decades pakistan has been desperately trying to internationalize the kashmir conflict and bring in third party mediation that's the reason why pakistan keeps bringing up kashmir at the un and as well as at the oic pakistan has even tried to encourage the united states and a few european countries to mediate the dispute between india and pakistan but each and every time india has resisted these attempts by stating that the kashmir dispute is purely a bilateral matter between india and pakistan so obviously in order to maintain consistency in its foreign policy india has the same stated policy with china as well no matter what aggression china shows against india with regard to the lac dispute and the larger border dispute India has consistently treated this dispute as purely a bilateral matter between India and China. Yes, India does appreciate support from other countries on these matters in the form of diplomatic support, sale of essential defense equipment, etc. But it has generally taken a stand against the formation of any alliances or clubs, keeping in line with its principle of strategic autonomy. So the editorial points out that India has stuck to its principle of strategic autonomy at the 2+2 dialogue. because despite the direct comments of the us against china india did not make any such comments and it carefully evaded getting caught in this tussle between us and china now let's take up a related column from page number 6 written by happy mon jacob in which he evaluates the viability of the quad and the indo pacific strategy for india see of late in india's foreign policy the terms quad and indo pacific doctrine have become the buzzwords There has been a lot of excitement amongst India's strategic community and diplomatic community regarding these strategies and they have been pushing the Indian government to pursue these strategies with like-minded countries such as US, Japan and Australia with the unstated objective of containing China's influence in the Indo-Pacific region. Publicly these countries do not refer to these strategies as being targeted against China with the exception of the United States because of late the US has made it very clear that the quad grouping is primarily aimed at china's aggression in the indo pacific however diplomatically the indo pacific doctrine has been projected as primarily a politico economic construct for the indo pacific region which has emerged as the hub of today's global economy and the quad has been projected as an informal grouping between india us japan and australia and it largely happens to be a strategic military construct that is focused on enforcing a rules based order in the indo pacific region in order to defend freedom of navigation and ensure that the indo pacific is free and open but these stated objectives of quad and indo pacific doctrine is nothing but an indirect reference to the rising economic and political influence of china in the indo pacific region and as well as to the rising aggression of china in the indo pacific region which has challenged freedom of navigation especially the south china sea in direct violation of a rules based order so for the sake of our analysis it is safe to conclude that the quad and the indo pacific doctrine that is being championed by these group of countries is primarily aimed at chinese influence in the region because see if you take china out of this equation 
then there is no rational for these strategies and groupings to exist. Because if you look at India, even though it is a major player in the Indian Ocean, it is not a major player in the Pacific Ocean. Similarly, if you look at Japan and Australia, they are major players in the Pacific Ocean, but definitely not in the Indian Ocean. Even though the US has considerable influence in both the Indian and the Pacific Ocean, it doesn't really form a basis for these countries to come together and pursue the Indo-Pacific doctrine as a politico-economic construct. The same logic applies for the Quad as well, because if you take China out of the equation, then there is no strategic rationale for these countries to come together to form an alliance that is focused on enforcing a rules-based order. So considering that China is the focus of the Quad grouping and the Indo-Pacific strategy, we need to evaluate whether India has the right capabilities to lead these groupings and strategies that are primarily targeted against China. And more importantly, is it in India's interest to trigger unnecessary hostilities with China for the sake of pursuing a closer strategic military relationship with these countries? Because see, however you look, China clearly outpowers India in the Indo-Pacific region. If you look at China's politico-economic construct for the Indo-Pacific, that is its Belt and Road Initiative, it is quite clear that China's ambitious connectivity project is way more advanced than the blue dot network that is being pursued by US, Japan and Australia and they are eager to include India as well under the blue dot network. While the blue dot network is backed only by the financial institutions of these countries, the BRI is sponsored directly by the Chinese government and a number of countries in the Indo-Pacific region have already signed on to China's BRI. This includes countries such as Bangladesh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka and a number of Southeast Asian and East Asian countries as well. But in contrast, if you look at India's economic engagement with the Indo-Pacific countries, it is quite minimal and it pales in comparison. For example, India's decision to quit the RCEP serves a major blow to India's economic influence in the Indo-Pacific. Because the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement is said to be the largest FTA which will promote free trade and movement of goods, services and investment in the Indo-Pacific region. The RCEP is primarily championed by China with other major economic powers from the Indo-Pacific and India has done itself a disservice by quitting the RCEP primarily due to domestic political compulsions. India quit the RCEP with the objective of protecting its domestic producers but this disengagement of India from the RCEP and the Indo-Pacific region directly contradicts India's strategy towards the Indo-Pacific. Because if India is planning to take on China in the economic domain in the Indo-Pacific region, then it should have stepped up its economic engagement with the region by being a part of the RCEP. Then moreover, the huge trade gap between India and China is something that we should also keep in mind. If you look at the bilateral trade between India and China, there is a huge trade deficit in favour of China, which indicates economic weakness on the part of India. Then more importantly, for the Indo-Pacific countries, China is a much more important economic partner than India. This is also a major trade gap between India and China as far as the Indo-Pacific region is concerned. Countries in the Indo-Pacific, such as Indonesia, Malaysia, South Korea, New Zealand, etc. They are far more economically dependent on China as they are with India. Their economies are very closely interlinked with the Chinese economy and they do not have such kind of dependency on the Indian economy. This highlights the minimal economic engagement of India in the Indo-Pacific region. Just take a look at the number of free trade agreements that India has signed with countries in this region. As of now, India does not have FTAs with Australia, with New Zealand, the United States, Bangladesh, Maldives, etc. We have signed FTAs with South Korea, the ASEAN group, with Japan and Sri Lanka. But however, China has signed FTAs with most of these countries except for US and currently it is negotiating an FTA with both Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. There are even talks going on for a trilateral FTA between China, Japan and South Korea that clearly highlights the economic dependency of the Indo-Pacific region on China. So this lack of economic influence on India's part in the Indo-Pacific defeats the very purpose of the Indo-Pacific doctrine. The writer's argument is that the economic rationale does not exist for India to pursue the Indo-Pacific doctrine as an economic strategy against Chinese dominance. Then the writer makes a similar argument with regard to the quadrilateral as well. 
even though the principal construct of the Quad is based as a strategic military alliance against China, it is China which is a predominant defense player in the region. China has already emerged as one of the key defense suppliers to most of the countries in the Indo-Pacific, despite having numerous disputes with these countries. Take for example, Southeast Asian countries such as Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines. All these Southeast Asian countries, they have standing maritime disputes with China in the South China Sea and they have been at the receiving end of China's aggression. But despite this, China is a key defense player because it supplies key defense equipment to most of the countries in the Indo-Pacific. In comparison, India's defense sales in the Indo-Pacific is very minimal and India's defense engagement in the Indo-Pacific is largely restricted to joint exercises and joint training. Then more importantly, the quadrilateral is a loosely structured informal grouping that lacks any coherence in ideology. And as explained, there are questions over its rational and capabilities as well. So through this column, the writer highlights the various challenges for India in its pursuit of the Indo-Pacific doctrine and in its desire to project the Quad as a strategic counter to China, one must not forget the overriding economic realities of the region. Now let's take up another column from page number 6 that deals with the topic of deep fakes and the threat posed by it. See a deep fake is basically a type of a synthetic media that is artificially created by using the self-learning algorithms of artificial intelligence. So basically a deep fake could be an audio clip, a video footage or an image that has been produced synthetically or artificially via the usage of artificial intelligence. Through this technology, you can swap faces in a video or in an image, you can carry out lip syncing and you can modulate the voice in an audio clip. So this technology of creating deep fakes or synthetic media in a world driven by cloud computing, artificial intelligence and vast volumes of data represents tremendous opportunities and as well as challenges. So the ability to create such synthetic media using AI creates numerous opportunities because it will simply transform the way we listen, speak or communicate on the social media. But however, it poses numerous challenges as well because deep fakes can be easily misused to promote fake news, to propagate disinformation and propaganda. Such deep fake audio clips, videos and images can be easily misused to manipulate individuals and as well as institutions because through such deep fakes, one's reputation could be easily destroyed by synthetically making the individual say unethical or controversial statements. Through deep fakes, extremist propaganda can be carried out on the internet, which could be used to polarize the society and to eventually sow social discord that could lead to communal riots as well. These fake videos could be easily used to damage one's reputation, especially popular individuals such as celebrities, politicians, etc. Through such disinformation and manipulation, violence can be easily incited in the society and hence the possible misuse of deep fakes has emerged as a major security challenge. Now imagine a deep fake video of a popular religious leader or a political leader who is seen to be making controversial statements against other communities. Such manipulative videos can easily instigate riots and violence thereby threatening security and stability in the society. Deep fakes also pose a specific threat to women because by using deep fakes, synthetic pornography could be generated in order to malign and destroy the reputation of women. This could also become a tool for blackmail through which the individuals could be exploited and harassed further. Then more dangerously, deep fakes can be easily used to disrupt democratic elections and to instigate revolt against governments and as well as to sow discord and confusion in the minds of the voters thereby disrupting the electoral process. Then another alarming possibility is that deep fakes could be used to counter truth and facts and replace it with fake news and misinformation. And the real threat is that these deep fakes could be easily weaponized by a nation state for geopolitical reasons. Through a well-designed campaign, intelligence agencies could wage a psychological war by promoting a negative campaign against a particular government, by disrupting elections in a target country, by trying to swing voter preferences in favor of a particular candidate or a certain party 
thereby compromising the national security of the target country. In a world which is driven by the internet and social media, fake news tends to travel faster and gain more acceptance as compared to the truth. That being the case, the potential misuse of deep fakes generated through artificial intelligence could further enable the spread of fake news and propaganda, thereby threatening the national security of a country, societal order in a particular country, and as well as an individual's reputation or an organization's reputation. So the writer concludes that this has to be the most serious threat that has emerged from artificial intelligence. And hence, there is an urgent need to come up with solutions to counter deep fakes. The writer says that what we need is a multi-stakeholder and multi-modal approach through which all the stakeholders can be brought together and through a collaborative exercise, the governments, the tech firms, the civil society, the common public, and more importantly, the media could be brought together to design solutions to counter deep fakes. It would be the responsibility of the government and the legislature to come out with appropriate legislative regulation that can not only regulate the creation and spread of deep fakes and also prohibit them and provide for suitable action against the perpetrators. So appropriate policies will have to be brought out by the government and even the tech firms especially the social media platforms, they need to come out with appropriate policies to flag deep fakes and also to take suitable action against them. The tech firms also have a responsibility to come out with suitable technological interventions through which deep fakes can be easily detected, thus helping in preventing the spread of deep fakes. Then more importantly, we need to focus on media literacy, wherein the consumer and as well as the journalists and the media organizations are made aware of the impact of deep fakes and they should be trained as to how such deep fake videos, audios and clippings can be identified. So there has to be greater awareness amongst the common public and as well as amongst the media organizations so that they can immediately dismiss any deep fake, thereby curbing its spread and impact. So considering the emergence of this threat, what we need is a critical consumer especially when we are consuming vast volumes of media on the internet. Every time we watch a video or look at an image or listen to an audio clip, we need to pause and question ourselves whether what I'm watching is authentic and genuine. And by following a basic set of precautions, one should be able to identify such deep fakes and then ensure that such deep fakes do not gain legitimacy. Now let's take up the practice questions for today. Which of the following city lies the closest to the Mudumulai National Park and Tiger Reserve? Is it Chennai or Coimbatore or Bengaluru or Tiruvananthapuram? The correct answer is option B, Coimbatore. Please look at this map. The Mudumulai National Park and Tiger Reserve is a part of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve located at the tri-junction of Karnataka, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Amongst the given options, the closest city would be Coimbatore, which is hardly around 150 kilometers from the Mudumulai National Park whereas Chennai, Bengaluru and Tiruvannathapuram are located far away. This question has been asked because on page number 1, the Hindu carries an image of an elephant at the Mudumulai Tiger Reserve. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? Green crackers are produced using less harmful raw materials and have additives which reduce emissions by suppressing dust. Green crackers don't contain banned chemicals such as lithium, arsenic, barium and lead. Using pyrotechnics, green crackers are designed to ensure that the emission of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide does not occur. All the three statements are correct, so option D is the right answer. Let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? Petroleum and Explosive Safety Organization or PESO is a regulatory authority with autonomous status. It functions under the Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. It administers the Explosives Act, Petroleum Act, Inflammable Substances Act, Environment Protection Act, etc. to control the import, export, transport, storage and usage of explosive materials and flammable materials. Amongst the given statements, the second statement is incorrect, so option D is the right answer. See, the second statement is incorrect because the Petroleum and Explosive Safety Organization functions under the Ministry of Commerce and its Department for the Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade. These two questions were asked because we have two articles on page number one and page number three that deals with green crackers. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? 
Kaziranga National Park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is recognized as an important bird area by BirdLife International. The park is home to a number of threatened species of animals such as the Great One-Horned Rhino, Indian Elephants, Bengal Tigers, Wild Asiatic Water Buffalo, Eastern Swamp Deer and the Snow Leopard. Amongst the given statements, the third statement is incorrect, so option B is the right answer. See, the Kaziranga National Park in Assam has been designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it has also been recognized as an important bird area by BirdLife International, which is a global NGO that works towards the conservation of birds, especially aquatic birds, and its habitat, which is wetlands. And the Kaziranga National Park is home to threatened species such as the Great Wanon Rhino, Indian Elephants, Bengal Tigers, Wild Asiatic Water Buffalo and the Barasinga or the Eastern Swamp Deer. And these five threatened species of animals are also referred to as the Big Five of the Kaziranga. But however, you cannot find the Snow Leopard in the Kaziranga National Park because Snow Leopards are endemic to the higher altitudes of the Himalayas. Whereas the Kaziranga National Park is located at the foothills of the Himalayas. So the correct answer is option B, 1 and 2 only. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 4, few workers at the Kaziranga National Park have been arrested on the charges of indulging in rhino horn trade. Now let's take up the next question. What are the intended applications of ISRO's EOS-01 satellite? Agriculture, forestry and disaster management support, navigation and precision guidance, highly encrypted military communication, improve internet services in remote areas. The correct answer is option A. See, EOS stands for Earth Observation Satellite and very soon, ISRO would be launching the first satellite under this series. These satellites are primarily meant for agriculture, forestry and disaster management support. Let's look at the next question. Which of the following best describes New Space India Limited? It is a branch of the DRDO to establish space-based weapon capabilities. It is a startup led by private entities to produce rocket and satellite components for ISRO. It is a central public sector enterprise and a commercial arm of ISRO with the objectives of scaling up industry participation in the Indian space program. It is a joint venture between India and Russia to develop the Gaganyaan mission. Amongst the given options, the correct answer is option C. New Space India Limited is a central PSU which was recently set up and it acts as one of the commercial arms of ISRO along with Antrix Corporation. While Antrix Corporation primarily deals with commercial launches of foreign satellites, New Space India Limited is looking at scaling up industry participation in the Indian space program and it is also involved in facilitating the launch of foreign satellites on Indian rockets. These two questions were asked because according to this article on page number 10, ISRO is all set to launch EOS-01 satellite on the PSLV rocket and during this mission, nine more foreign satellites would also be launched as per a commercial agreement that has been worked out by New Space India Limited. Now let's take up the next question. Gift City in Gujarat has been set up as a special economic zone for textile manufacturing, international financial services center, automobile manufacturing hub, oil refining hub. The correct answer is option B. Gift City in Gujarat is an international financial services center. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 14, the United Kingdom, which is considered as the hub of financial services, is looking to partner with India for developing the Gift City in Gujarat, which is emerging as India's first international financial services center. Now let's take up a question from the 2016 prelims paper. Project Loon, sometimes seen in the news, is related to wireless communication technology. Option B is the right answer. See, Project Loon is an ongoing project of Google and its parent company Alphabet Inc. And under this project, it is testing out the provision of wireless communication technology through balloons that are suspended in the air. This project of Google is expected to improve internet connectivity, especially in remote areas. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, in countering China, India must note that strategic talk alone cannot trump overriding economic realities. Critically evaluate. The second question, deep fakes have emerged as the most serious threat posed by artificial intelligence. Comment. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.